Good morning. Good morning, Calvary Chapel young people. We are traveling. We are in another place in Texas because we're going to go to a grandson's wedding today, and we're so excited about it. Yes, we are. We are. And Rudy is actually going to do the wedding for them. Oh, yes. It's my honor to marry my grandson and uh, his bride-to-be, so I'm excited about that. But this week, if you remember, we uh, on, last week we studied about the Bible, that the Bible in its total is all about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's full of clues, and it helps us to have a better understanding of who Jesus was and how we can walk closer to him through studying the Bible. That's true. And this week we will continue in that vein. And today we're going to talk about the true meaning of love. And the story that we will read about, the, what we're going to study, is about Peter's denial of Jesus. And then his restoration. And when we say restoration, we mean bringing him back into being a, a servant of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. And believing, when he was in denial, believing that his life was his own. You remember Jesus told him that he would, be, he would deny Jesus three times before the rooster crew. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. And, and when that happened, Peter was in the belief that his life was his own, that he could do what, whatever he could. He needed to do whatever he, he could to preserve it. When he was in danger, he was afraid. And he, he denied Jesus. But all that really did was, was show his weakness, show his weak faith. And then Jesus died on the cross for him. And he saw that, and he uh, turned around. He, his faith was restored. Jesus reached out to Peter in forgiveness and reconciliation. And that's, that's where we, what we mean by Peter's restoration, by Jesus' act and Jesus' forgiveness. And the result was that Peter then, rather than denying Jesus, became a man who would be able to love fully, not just only Jesus, but everyone, and to serve Jesus' mission. We find out, we use the term denying, and I think we probably need to define it a little bit. Denying Jesus means to reject the knowledge of Jesus, of who he is, or to abandon him and his, what he wants for us in our life. And Peter did that for a short period of time because mm -hmm. he was afraid. Mm -hmm. But we will see as we go through the study that Jesus' love for us and our, his love for Peter transcends anything that we do that may be deemed um, rejecting Christ. He will reach out to you and ask you to come home. So when we find ourselves denying or being tempted to deny Jesus. It can, it can happen in different times, under different situations, and look kind of differently from time to time. But one time you might find yourself tempted to deny Jesus or actually doing it is, is when you find yourself feeling embarrassed about being a Christian or, or feeling ashamed about being, like if you're hanging out with friends who think Christians are weird. Sometimes you just kind of slough off your Christianity then, and, and that's denying Jesus, that, and we do that sometimes. And sometimes we might rep rep misrepresent Jesus, and the only way that we can represent Jesus well is by learning about him. And the best way to do that, of course, is what we're doing this morning, which is studying about, his, the, about Jesus and the Bible and trying, and trying to walk with him and, and daily praying to him. And then we also might deny Jesus when we're hypocritical. Because, like, for example, sometimes people say that they're followers of Jesus, but then they don't do what Jesus asks them to do. Yeah, and their life doesn't reflect anything about Jesus. No, so they may be doing all the things that they know that would not be pleasing to Jesus at all. And then turning around and saying they're a Christian. And, and that's... that's that's hypocritical. You're not doing what you say you think. And 
that is another way that we might find ourselves as human beings that sin, we may find ourselves denying Jesus. Yeah. All right, so. Uh, Should we give a prayer to get going? Yes, and I'll lead us in that prayer. Thank you. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, uh, for just the opportunity to talk with our young people, to share your word, to share your love that you have for each and every one of us. And you tell us that the, the greatest commandment is to love you, and the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor. And without love, we really don't have anything. So it's really important as we talk about this lesson is to understand the great love Jesus has for us. Uh, and I also thank you for this day because uh, we're going to witness in a few hours the marriage of my grandson and uh, to his sweetheart. And we're just really thankful that they're getting married. And we ask that you bless that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to start reading in the book of Matthew. And we will also read a little bit from the book of John today. But we're going to start in Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. When Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now, continuing in Matthew, but jumping to verse 69 through 71, it says, Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out in the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. And he denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. So he denied him three times. Mm -hmm. Now we go to John, and we're in John 21. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going to be going with you also. They went out immediately, got into the boat. That night, they caught nothing. Now, this takes place after Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. <clears throat> and his, re or his resurrection from the tomb. And this is several days later. Peter is discouraged. What does he do? He's a fisherman, so he goes fishing. Some of the other disciples were all fishermen, and they follow him. Picking up at verse 4 in John 21, But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not yet know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast. And now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. They had too many fish to pull them in. Continuing in verse 7, it says, Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. They recognized who it was now. Mm -hmm. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it and plunged to the sea. 
Verse 11, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153, although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Knowing it was the Lord. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said it to him a second time, Simon, son of Judah, Jonah, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And then he said a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. So we see Jesus reaching out to Peter and restoring Peter to a right relationship and forgiving Peter for what he did when the Lord was taken captive. And he did that because he loved Peter. And he had a plan for Peter's life. And that was Peter was to be a great disciple. He led many, many, many people to know Jesus Christ. So even though we fail sometimes, if we mm -hmm. reach out to the Lord, he'll lift us up, dust us off, mm -hmm. and get us on the right track. And that's exactly what he did with Peter. Now, we get to ask questions. Question time. It's my favorite time of the lesson. All right, question one. Who said he would not fall away and leave Jesus? Well, well, Peter said that. He said he would not fall away and that he and leave Jesus alone. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He knew that he loved Jesus. And when Jesus told the disciples about what was going to happen, Peter knew without a shadow of, the, of a doubt. He, he didn't question it at all. He knew that what Jesus was describing wasn't going to happen to him. At least that's what he thought. And as we know, sometimes we think a thing and then something changes. Well, it, it, it just goes to the point we don't really know. We have to always stay in tune with God because mm -hmm. we don't know how we're going to react that's and right. what kind of situations we'll face. But if we trust in God, he will guide us. And if we don't just react to a situation, but we look to God for an answer and direction in any given difficulty, he will give us an answer and he'll point us in a direction. Okay, question number two. What did the disciples do after Jesus was taken away? Well, at, when Jesus was taken away, the disciples scattered. They went in every direction. Peter's decision to deny even knowing Jesus was based on the fear of the pain and the humiliation that they would receive, and, and even death. Peter was afraid that if people knew he was one of Jesus' followers, they would do very similar to him as they had done to Jesus. And at this point, where three times he denied knowing Jesus, he gave in to his fear, and he rejected Jesus' love. Okay, in number three, Someone said they recognized what about Jesus? Well, they said they know him from his or, accent. Excuse me, what about oh, Peter? About accent. Peter's accent. So they, we know people who come from Mexico. We know people who come from Italy. We know people who come from various places in Africa. And while they speak English, they sound a little bit differently than people that we know who were born and raised in the United States. And in, in fact, we can know people who live in, in the south, southern part of the country who speak differently than people who, speak, who live in New England. People accuse me of that a lot. Well, that's because you have a southern accent, darling. You were <laughs> raised in the south. And, 
And that's, that's exactly what they're saying. We know your accent, we know where you're from, is what they're saying. And accents can be heard in the way people from different places around the world, around our country, speak words. And while we may not know it, when other people speak and we hear them talk, we kind of start to make a story in our head about them and where sure. they come from. And that's what was happening there when they said, when somebody said about Peter, we know you, we hear your accent, we know you're a follower of Jesus. Question four, what did Peter and some of the other disciples decide to do after Jesus' death? Well, they decided to go fishing. They had gone on so many fishing trips together and with Jesus that it, it really was a, a, a natural, easy thing for them to do. And, and sometimes when we're sad, when we're confused, when life just isn't making much sense, the best thing we can think of to do is something that we've done a lot of, something that comes very natural for us and helps us take our mind off of what's troubling us. And so the, the disciples were fishermen and fishermen fish. And they were, they were in such a, a place where fishing was comforting to them and that's what they did. What did the stranger on the shore tell the disciples to do? Now, we know this was Jesus, but at, that's, at this point, they didn't recognize him as Jesus. So. Well, the stranger on the shore told them to cast their nets on the right side of the boat. So they apparently had been throwing the nets over the left side of the boat. And the, the stranger said, well, toss them in that way. And um, we know sometimes, and we love people that sometimes have special insights into situations. And sometimes they've gone through something that they've lived through something or they know something about the, the situation or someone about the situation. In regardless of the situation, if we love them and we respect them, their advice can be very, very helpful. The stranger on the shore offered advice that couldn't hurt the disciples to follow, so they did what the stranger said. And it paid off big time. They caught so much fish they couldn't bring it into the boat. And, and Jesus, we know, he knows everything about our lives. And he has insight into every single situation we face, whether we're, we've got a friend who's mad at us, or we've done something that we shouldn't have done and we know, or we've got somebody in our family who's hurting. Jesus understands all of those situations. And if we should ever need any help or advice, all we have to do is ask him. And he will tell us which way to go or which way to cast our nets every time. Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that is the best advice that anybody can give you, is to wait on Jesus, listen to your heart when he talks to you, and follow that advice, because he will never give you bad advice or point you in a wrong direction. Never. Okay, question number six. Who dove into the water to reach the shore where Jesus was waiting? Well, this is a really happy moment in this story. So, you know, Peter has denied Jesus. This is the end of the story where Peter dives into the water. He's so excited. He wants to reach the shore once he realized that that was Jesus that was waiting for him. And think about, think about how happy you need to be to dive into the water. We don't know how cold it was or we don't know how far out he was. We just know that he didn't really even seem to think about it. He just dove in to go to the Lord. He was anxious to see Jesus. And I think he was probably looking to say inwardly or privately to Jesus, please forgive me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why he was so anxious to get to shore. Yeah. Okay, our final question this week. How many times did Jesus asked Peter if he loved him. Three times. Three times. So many times our emotions rise up to the surface. So you can tell when somebody's emotions are at the surface if they're crying or if they're laughing. And our emotions, they could be, they can be joy, but they can also be shame, guilt, sadness. They might be sorry. They might regret. And we think Peter was feeling all of those things. And when, Je when Jesus asked Peter if he loved him, he wasn't trying to make Peter feel
feel bad over and over. He was trying to give Peter the opportunity to express his love over and over. And so even though at one time Peter had denied him, he, Jesus gave Peter a chance to make it right. And he does that with all of us. When we sin, it, it's never the end of us for Jesus. He's not done with us. He will always, always offer us forgiveness, always. And that's exactly what he did with Peter. By allowing Peter to express his love three separate times, it built Peter back up. Yeah. And we know that Peter became the rock on which he would build the church. So uh, just remember, there's nothing you can do that will ever make God turn his back on you. Nothing you can do. Nothing. There's always forgiveness for us. Well, that is the end of this week. Uh, we, as we say, we're getting, we're all excited. We're getting ready to go to, to a wedding. wedding. Yeah. And we just hope you all have a wonderful weekend. We hope you have a great time at church tomorrow. And we look forward to seeing you all very, very soon. Very soon. So, would you close us in prayer? Yes. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your words of encouragement, the fact that we know that no matter what we do, if we look to you for forgiveness, Lord, you will grant that forgiveness, that there's nothing that we can do that would cause you to stop loving us. We just have to be able to know that we can reach out, touch you, and the more we study your word, the more we pray, the more time we spend contemplating, studying, reading, praying, talking, there's lots of different terms. Just the more time we spend with you, Lord, you'll build our strength, you'll build us up, and you will put us on the path that you would have us go and accomplish those things that you want us to accomplish in our life. It's not always easy to do that, but you always point us in the right direction, and you will always give us the necessary tools to accomplish what you want us to do in our lives. So we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to speak with our young people, and... Uh, Again, I thank you for the marriage that's going to happen this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.